Hey guys. Um, so, to start our afternoon, we have Justin Lewis here. Uh, Justin Lewis Nehio is the co-founder of Vancouver-based Section 35. Justin is a member of the Samson Cree Nation and was born and raised on the Samson Reserve in Muscochise, Alberta, and is now based on the west coast of British Columbia. Section 35 was created with the mission to use art and fashion to empower and bring people together on the foundation of truth. Along with the original designs, Section 35 also collaborates with Indigenous artists around the Indian country in the form of modern Indigenous sweatwear, streetwear, <laughs> blending the past, present, and future with Indigenous street style. So if you want to follow Justin on Instagram, you can go at Section 35, all spelled out. Facebook, you can find him on Section 35, and Twitter at SCNT35. So I'll give it over to Justin if you want to give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Let's see. How's that? Okay, you guys hear me? Good. Okay, how's everyone doing today? Good, good. Right on. So. Uh, my name is Justin Lewis, as she said, and uh, I was born and raised out here in uh, Muscogee. So uh, I've put together a little bit of a presentation for you guys just to kind of give you an idea of, of what I do with Section 35 and, and the work that we do and kind of how we got to where we're at. So um, first off, you know, obviously I was born here. Uh, I grew up just out on Six Mile. My parents still live there, so that's where I uh, stay when I come out here. And, you can see that's a photo of me back when I was playing Tykes hockey out here, the goalie there. That's me just as a little guy. So, um, so I'm a member of the Samson Cree Nation and I grew up playing hockey and baseball and, and uh, that kind of really took me on a journey to get outside of the reserve and where I'm at right now. And so I played baseball competitively and uh, when I got done high school I was recruited to play baseball down in California. And, uh, I got my business degree down there and, and that really kind of jump started me to get to where I'm at. So, you know, growing up, I was encouraged to stay in school. And so, you know, I finished high school, I finished college, you know, and education was always really important. And I, that was stressed on me and my parents taught me to think outside the box. So, um, I attended university, uh, California State University, and I played Division II baseball. And you can see there's a photo of me. Um, back in my playing days. I'm retired now and I, don't, I used to play in the summer but not anymore. I don't have time for that. So uh, when I was done playing baseball I got my, uh, my business degree. I got a Bachelor of Science in Business Management and uh, that was from Cal State Stanislaus. And so it took me six years, uh, six long years to get that but I got it and once I was done I started working in the business world and my first professional job was with the startup uh, real estate company and our uh, CEO uh, was a pretty eccentric guy. He had one glass eye and he used to wear cowboy boots with his $2,000 suit. So he's a really interesting guy. But um, that kind of, that job was probably one of the most influential jobs in, in kind of helping me become an entrepreneur and, and uh, seeing where and what I could do with, with something of my own. And uh, I'll tell you a little story about his you know, kind of what, what he did and, and his goal was to create his own real estate company and he started um, a self-storage brand. And so, you know, when I started with them, it was, it was a startup company. There was, I think, maybe 10 of us in the office and he was fronting, you know, all the bills, everything was coming out of his own pocket. And so we were there from the very start with his branding and, and helping get all that stuff going with that. And just a couple of years ago, uh, I read in the news that he sold his company for a couple billion dollars. So uh, that was really cool for me to be a part of something from the start and to watch it kind of mature and become something, uh, you know, that he really wanted to do. And uh, when I started with him, I interviewed with him and uh, it was back in 2008. And I don't know if you guys, you guys are probably way too young, but uh, down in the States, the economy basically took a, uh, a basically tanked at that time and you know I had just finished school and I was desperate to find a job and I interviewed with him and he basically said 
it's not going to cost me a whole lot of money to hire you, is it? And I was, you know, I was so hungry to work and get my foot in the door that I said no. And so I took a job with him and it ended up being when I left that company, I was helping run his marketing department uh, and working very closely with a graphic designer who basically introduced me to graphic design and, and taught me a lot of the basics, which helped me get to where I'm at right now designing. So um, for me, when I look back, that is probably one of the most influential jobs I've had. And so after years of working in the business world, you know, I wanted to start my own business and that was kind of how Section 35 was born. I was working, not happy doing what I was doing, working for somebody else. And I've always been a fan of art and fashion and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I had met a guy in Vancouver playing baseball and he ran a screen printing business. And I, so I started making t-shirts of my own and I had made a couple uh, of some old hockey teams that, if you guys remember the Hobie Mahawks, everybody uses the Hawks logo now, but back in the day it was a junior, junior hockey team. And so I made a couple t-shirts with that logo and I also made some jerseys that, uh, the old Hobie Mahawks Oilers jerseys uh, for Christmas gift for a couple of my friends. And from that point we started having a conversation about, hey, maybe we could do something. We have all the tools in the shop to create our own stuff. And so that was really the, the jump start of Section 35. <clears throat> so there's a photo of a friend of mine. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Nako Bear, he's a singer songwriter, out tours all over. And uh, he wore that jacket at one of his shows and it's pretty cool. I love that photo, so I just put that up there. So anyways, who are we? So it's uh, myself and I have a friend, uh, business partner, Andrew, who works uh, in Vancouver. He runs a screen printing shop, uh, full service shop, and we run our business out of there in East Van. Um, and so we were founded in late 2013. And we really didn't launch until March of 2016. So in that span of two to three years, I spent a lot of time working on business plans, uh, kind of researching competition, you know, what's happening in, in the native apparel industry, mainstream apparel industry, streetwear. How do we fit into that? How can we create something that, you know, is going to appeal to people? How are we going to, you know, create a sustainable business out of that? Um, and, you know, the apparel industry, it's crowded market space. There's everybody's making shirts and doing all that stuff. Uh, so it really took me a long time to be ready. I was working full time at the time, so that also kind of factored into not being able to do it. But we got to a point where people were, okay, where is, where's your company? Where are you guys? Where's your website? And March uh, 2016, we launched our website. So, and we are based in Vancouver. Um, Vancouver, we have a website, www.section35.com is our website. So, and, uh, yeah, I, I guess I label us Indigenous Streetwear. I use the hashtag Indigenous Street Style. It's just something that I like to figure streetwear is, you know, if you guys are familiar with different streetwear companies. But, you know, I really aspire to be that kind of a company. And then on top of what we do, you know, I try to mix in some socially conscious messaging with our designs and our work. And um, I'll get to that a little bit later, a little bit more in depth. So, Section 35. So, our mission, you know, basically I say we use art and fashion to bring people together. You know, in my opinion, art's kind of something that bring, breaks down barriers. People, you know, if people appreciate art, you know, it, it creates, you know, it brings people together. That's just the basics of it. That's how I believe and, um, you know, we wanted to bring clothing that brings a message to, to people around indigenous issues. And, and uh, there's a lot of different issues in Indian country that are happening right now and for me uh, it was important that I create something that you know had a message that wasn't just pushing out something that was you know there was no relevance to it and so I, I you know I tackle all kinds of different topics um, we also do a lot of work with different uh, artists around Indian country uh, we do a lot of work with a guy from Santiago uh, named Santiago who's from Chicago and uh, his artwork is you know, for me, it, it really speaks to me, and that's why I wanted to work with him. And I'll show you some of his stuff after. And as far as indigenous fashion and art, I, I want to kind of push the boundaries of what's being done with that. And, you know, I could talk a lot in depth about, 
what that means. But for me, it's, it's kind of indigenizing streetwear and, and doing something in our own way. And, and maybe that's not being done so broad term on as far as indigenous fashion and, and kind of pushing boundaries of what people think that is. You know, a lot of the content that we focus on, you know, people. And then racism, obviously. Racism is a, you know, I grew up experiencing racism my whole life. My kids experience it, you know. I'm sure you guys have all experienced it. So I think it's important that we can talk about a lot of that stuff and bring it to the forefront. And with me, I just try to use that as, as uh, by using fashion to do that, so. And so this is actually, I was telling you about Santiago. This is a, a beaded medallion that I had done uh, with a piece of art with him on, called Kill Mascot, Save the People. And so I had a friend who's a Ojibwe uh, bead that for us. And uh, this was part of a collection we launched last fall that kind of really put us on the map as far as uh, a, a business in, in Indian country. And so here are a couple of our highlights from this past year was we, we headlined the streetwear section in uh, Vancouver Indigenous Fashion Week. Uh, we also headlined at a, a gallery in Santa Fe at Indian Market this summer. And then we also headlined at Otapiaki uh, Fashion Week in Calgary. So when I started this, this business, I always said, I'm not going to do fashion shows. I think that's stupid and, and all that stuff. And here this weekend, or this summer, I was you know, walking out on the runway waving to people at a fashion show. <laughs> It was, a, it was a weird experience for me, but it was also uh, really rewarding, and, and it was cool to bring our stuff to a, a whole new audience. And uh, from there, you know, we've, been, we've had pieces of clothing featured in uh, Marie Claire magazine. Uh, we were one of the top designers to look out for at Vancouver Indi Indigenous Fashion Week with Flair magazine. And we've got clothing that's featured on the TV show Letterkenny. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Letterkenny, you guys know that TV show. It's more of a, a mainstream show. So uh, a lot of interesting spin-offs come from, from Section and, and what we've done. And these are just a couple of the ones that, that I thought of that came to mind. Um, so as far as Section 35, I like to look at uh, what it means to be kind of an entrepreneur. and starting your own business uh it's it's definitely you know it's a big risk to take and i always talk about it as is it's a commitment um it's a, it is a full-time job there's no nine to five you know you work when you got to work and for me uh I, I don't, it's really rewarding i don't think i could go back and do the nine to five thing i'd rather work on weekends or evenings when when i feel that and so for me it was a commitment. I had to be all in or else it just wasn't going to work. And uh, still to this day, it's, it's a full-time job, you know, and I'm not here getting to talk to you guys. You know, I'm in between sending emails or, you know, social media, different, different types of stuff. So for me, uh, that's what entrepreneurship is. Uh, planning, you know, we had to start with a business plan. You know, what do we look, what does our business look like, you know? How are we gonna how are we gonna pay for everything? How are we gonna pay our bills? You know, all these different things. What, when, why? Lots to think about financial. You know, I've I lost track of how much of my own money I've I've invested just to get the business off the ground. And to me, the the it's the reward of putting something out there that people like that is your own, that you have full creative control. That's you know, to me that's worth it. Um, and I spent like I said, I spent a lot of time researching competition. You know, what kind of businesses are, are out there? You know, you guys are probably familiar with some of them. You know, there's a lot of, you guys know who Nietzsche Gear is, the natives, different companies uh, in the market space who are doing what we do. So I have to think about, okay, what are we doing to compete with them? Who are our customers? You know, there's a lot of, ultimately we have to think about who our customers are. Um, you, you know, our customers pay the bills for us. So how do we appeal to them? There's a lot of different, aspects of that and then executing um, what it is that we need to do. Um, so for us, you know, when I look at the market space and the challenges we had, you know, it's a crowded space. Um, how do we set ourselves apart? For me, one of the, the first things I did when we first launched, I created a t-shirt that you know, had a swear word on it, and it said F colonialism, and it was a hockey logo that was flipped around. And 
we needed something out there that caught people's attention right off the bat and that kind of built up to the hype of uh, our launch. Unfortunately, like two days before our website went live, we got a, a cease and desist letter from the NHL for that design, so we weren't able to sell it. But um, the story is, is like we, you know, we, we really wanted to create something that was eye-catching, and we've since created a bunch of different design, designs with that slogan. And it's kind of become part of our business model. I, my mom hates that I put out shirts that have the, the F word on it, but, <laughs> you know, I gotta, we got to do something exciting. So, um, As far as the business, um, branding, uh, I grew up with a business degree. Uh, like I said, I cut my teeth in, in a marketing department, and, and branding was one of the very first things that I, you know, I knew we had to nail down. Um, you guys are familiar with, you know, companies like Nike, and if you guys see the swoosh, you know what that means, right? You know, so for us, we had to create a logo that was kind of appealing and that could stand alone, and, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, we call it the talking feather, and you guys have your shirts on. It's the, the feather that's in the middle of the O, and, you know, we... Designing logos is actually really hard, but for us, we nailed that down on our first sit down and we were like, okay, I don't know if we can do anything better than that right now. We'll sit on it. Came back, looked at it the next day. Wow, that's pretty good. Okay, we'll look at it next week. We'll come back next week. It, it, was, it just stuck. It was something that we felt right and it's, you know, we get a lot of compliments on people on our logo and, you know, we've been trying to work on some secondary logos on, on designs and stuff and, I tell you what, it's really hard to, to find something that is worked out as easy as that. So, um, branding, our name, Section 35. Um, are you guys familiar with Section 35, just in, where that comes from? Maybe some of you guys are. Anyway, so uh, I used to do some work in, in uh, consulting work in Indigenous relations, and so Indigenous law was kind of at the forefront of that work and section 35 kind of really just jumped out at me and that's the part of our constitution that recognizes and protects our treaty and our indigenous rights in this country so there's a subtle you know political side and undertone to what we do and that's where that came from and I get a lot of questions from people who ask ask about it you know native people non-native people and it's it's a good conversation starter it's a, you know it's a teaching point and it just worked really well for us as a company and as far as marketing, branding, all that stuff, there's just, it works on all different levels and it's just catchy. So as far as sales go, marketing, you know, we, we use social media as basically our, our marketing platform. You know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, we have Tumblr, you know, but primary uh, Instagram is probably our, our number one um, platform to use and we just reached 11,000 followers and I always said I wanted to see us get to 10,000 where you no longer see the numbers it just becomes a K and so we've we've got to that recently you know and maybe if we could get to 100,000 followers that would be mind-blowing for me but you know we, we push out a lot of content on our social media because that drives our sales uh, here's a photo from a photo shoot that I just did with uh, Dresus, uh in Vancouver and um, I spent a lot of time shooting photos for our own content. Um, I also freelance a little bit and then I have a lot of friends who are photographers who you know are always willing to work with us and it's cool to let people freestyle on their photography and you know I like to see you know photographers put things through you know different lens every time each photographer has their own viewpoint on the world on how they see things and so it's really cool uh, to let photographers freestyle on our photography and I think it adds to the concept of, of art as, as part of what we do you know there's an art to it and so I, I, I'm really particular about content that we share and photo, photo, photographs sorry I can't even talk here and I think it's important as far as, you know, part of your branding as a company to be really professional. And so I spend a lot of time editing photos and, and then just working and getting people to do photo shoots for us. So sales, sales is always a, I mean, if you don't sell anything, you're never going to be able to pay your bills and you can't keep doing what you're doing. So it drives a lot of what we do. Oh, just a sec. 
I don't like to be concerned about money, but as a business, you have to be. And so I spent a lot of time reviewing, you know, where we're at with our sales and what sold, what didn't sell. When I first started, you know, we started really basic. I think we had three or four designs and um, I wanted to push more, but I think some of the, the biggest mistakes businesses do when they first start is they just go straight out and they invest a lot of money. And if you don't sell anything, you have money sitting on the shelves and dead stock. So we started out fairly small and we've kind of gradually grown with the, the amount of stuff that we're selling. And I mean, it's always a risk. Sometimes the best designs are the, some of the coolest things you do. You don't think, you know, you think they're going to sell and they don't sell. And then some of the mediocre stuff maybe sells a lot better. And, you know, it's, a, it's always kind of a juggling match on, on how you're going to do. And every time I push something out new or a new design out, like I'm nervous, it, it, I get really nervous for some reason. Partially, I think, because it's your art, your designs, but it's also what if it doesn't sell? You know, we've invested money into putting this out there. So sales drives what we do. Uh, and then just the consumer, who is our audience? Um, we have to kind of think about, you know, what, what does our following and our, our customers, what do they like? What's selling? You know, what are they buying? What do they want to spend their money on? What don't they want to buy? You know, and, and how do we appeal to our customers? And then customer service. You know, I spend a lot of time doing emails, responding to people who have questions. We get DMs all the time on our social media asking all the, the most mundane questions to people complaining about prices and you know you name it and we've had to deal with it so that takes up a lot of time uh, but you know maybe one day if we get bigger you know we'll have a, a customer service team who can take that off my hands but I think it's important that you connect with the, the customer and you know I, I spend a lot of time doing that and I think it goes a long way because we get compliments on you know responding to emails quickly and messages and stuff so and then setting milestones. I set a lot of different milestones, you know, on sales. You know, what kind of, what, you know, if we've invested so much money on a drop, how much do we want to make off it? Okay, how much do we break even? You know, what's it going to cost us to break even? You know, we do a lot of that kind of stuff behind the scenes. But like I said, at the end of the day, everything's a risk for us. But it's also, you know, the risk and the reward. So, oh. sorry. Okay, so here's a little bit, is this on? I'll just talk from here then. Okay, so streetwear, so fashion, or fashion with a message. So a couple of the, the slogans and stuff that we've done, the campaigns, uh, I mentioned the, the F colonialism one, that was one that we do. This summer we actually did a campaign, uh, the Canada, 150 was coming on and there was all this talk about it and so we did a campaign called Canada Don't 150 and we put out two t-shirt designs uh, one featuring uh, they're both Mohawks from uh, out in Quebec and we had permission from their families to use their images for this campaign and one was of uh, Canetio Horn's uh, mom she's an actress her mom pregnant standing beside this big rock that said uh, you're on Indian land and then the other one was from the Oka crisis, and it was the late Dan Phillips, and he was swinging on a, a Canadian soldier. So the imagery was really, you know, kind of, you know, controversial in a sense, but we wanted to kind of bring some truth to some of the stuff that's happened in the last 150 years. And, you know, my one thing about using those images and, and images of people's family was that I felt that anything we, any money we made off of that campaign should go back into that community. And so we linked up with the foundation in their community and we decided that all the proceeds we made off those shirts would go back into that uh, foundation which handles uh, money for funding for cultural and language revitalization in their community. So uh, that was one that I'm really proud of. We did pretty good with that and you know the shirts I see them on Instagram and all over the place. And then Kill Mascots, Save the People is probably one of our most, probably if not our most well-known campaign that we've did, and that was based off of uh, Native mascots in the Chicago Blackhawks logo. And you know, 
if you guys are familiar with native ma mascot tree and the controversy around the Redskins, Cleveland Indians, you guys, you know, so we had, nobody had really done something on the Blackhawks and we did it with uh, Santiago, who is actually a Chicago-based artist. And it's interesting how that came about as I had been following him for a while and I bought some of his art. And when I started the company, I asked him if he'd want to collaborate on some work. And he was like, absolutely, let me know when you're ready. And I bought a painting off him and it was the Blackhawks logo, but it was kind of flipped into kind of how you saw the beaded medallion that was up there. And I said, hey, what do you think about doing this? And he was like, let's do it. And so we ended up making camouflage jackets with patch kits on the back and hoodies with patches on it that said, kill mascot, save the people. And, and uh, we dropped it on November, Black Friday, which is like a big uh, shipping or shopping day and weekend in the States and I guess up here as well. And that really, like when we, we released that, that put us on the map. I think we did maybe $20,000 in sales in like 12 hours. And that for, you know, that was more than we had made the whole first six months of running our business. And, you know, and then looking at it, we had to like, oh man, now we got to go ship all these packages out, you know, so it was, it was great, but the work was just, you know, it was a lot of work and it kind of forced us to tighten up our business, our shipping, uh, all these different things that we'd been kind of lagging on. It really kind of made us bring the business together and okay, we have something here. What, what's next? So... Um, pushing the limits, like I said, swear words, I mean, I, I, you know, my mom doesn't like that I use swear words, but um, imagery, you know, a lot of different controversial images, you know, I think there's a fine line with using that for shirts, but, you know, if it's, if it's in the right, if it's tasteful and I think it fits with what we do, you know, we're not afraid to kind of, you know, share a little bit of the truth and that's kind of part of our brand is the truth, so conversation and dialogue, it's important. I think if clothing can do that, you can say a lot with a t-shirt. I, I, you know, I'm a big believer in that. The simplest t-shirt can say the most. So, and just bringing awareness to issues, uh, giving back to the community. We do a lot of different, you know, campaigns here and there where, you know, the money we make, we can, we can re redistribute that to, you know, a youth program or, or a basketball team for women on the inner, in the inner city. There's different, you know, kinds of campaigns that we'll run. And then just inspirations for designs. I'm, I'm inspired by just about everything. I mean, think for me, one of the biggest ones is sports, just because I'm an old athlete. You know, sportswear is probably one of the first places I go for my designs. And you can probably see it. There's a lot of baseball inspiration in, in everything. And then hockey. So, and then just politics, being indigenous, you know, a lot of the stuff that I see in the real world, it's just, you know, some days I'll be sitting there and I'll, I'll have an idea pop up and it's like, boom, that would be a dope shirt. Go home, work on it. It just happens, you know, so. Uh, I want to show you guys a couple of videos just to kind of give you some visuals of what we've done and then uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about each one after it's done. So, uh, this is the first one and this was from our, our summer campaign. Tomorrow but today See death creeping around the corner Call the calling on another fallen warrior In the land of the forgotten Bad seeds already rotten Popping pills to fill the void of death knocking You can guarantee the feds watching Cause we grew up around these revolutionaries Who went to wounded and need to get their hearts buried Raised the hustle once I see my mama struggle Born in the heart where our chiefs bled Where the water tastes like lead Where we deal with these alcoholics and meth heads Fed lies from the school system Misinterpret Thanksgiving Teach history like it's fiction What's written ain't fact We take down these flags Raise an eagle staff I'm a warrior Last of a dying breed With 
dreams of being free Hooked up to the tree to breathe so that was from our summer, and I just kind of had a friend who uh, I asked him to film some of our stuff at Vancouver Indigenous Fashion Week, and it just kind of spiraled into a promo video. And so we were just we went out in Vancouver one day with a couple of friends and shot some video and um, just put together kind of a promo video with some visuals. You know, that's one thing I'm trying to expand on is is into like film a little bit. You know, some and. It turned out pretty cool, you know, it didn't cost a lot of money. It helps to have a lot of friends who are artistic and, and are willing to work with us. So that was, you know, I thought that was really cool. The next one I have is probably the latest one we did and it's, I, I shot it down in White Sands with a friend of mine, two friends, uh, down in New Mexico this summer when we were down there for, uh, Indi or for Indian Market. And basically I drove to Santa Fe all by myself, slept in my car, and stayed with friends and wanted to really go down to, to White Sands and shoot a video for some leggings that we had coming out. So it turned out pretty cool. The place is unreal. It's, it's really like, basically it's a White Sands dunes in the middle of the desert. And like if you go there at sunset, it's just unreal. And so I'd been wanting to go there for a couple of years. My mom is actually from New Mexico, so I'm familiar with New Mexico, but I'd never been down there. And so that was one place from early on, I was like, we need to shoot down there. So we did a photo shoot and filmed a video. And so here's the video. Uh, just a sec. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, that was, uh, it's really funny stories. We, uh, we went out there and, and um, there's an Air Force base right next to the dunes and there's a, you're not allowed to fly drones around. And uh, anyways, my friend had a drone, so we went and flew a drone around and filmed out there and then got out of there real quick. Um, but, you know, it, for me, it's, it's more about, you know, being able to create stuff with friends that I know and, and you know, when I watch stuff like this, I'm always really stoked on it because it's something that I envisioned in my head and then I, I made it happen. So, happy to share that with you guys here. Let's see. So, just kind of like uh, finishing up here, I want to, you know, I think it's important that you find something that you're passionate about. For me, clothing, uh, art, design, all these different things are, are really important to me and I'm passionate about it. So, when I'm working, you know, long hours or I'm working at 10 o'clock at night trying to get something done, like, it, it's, it doesn't, it's not work for me because I'm, I'm doing what I want to do. And I think that's important and, and I recommend that, like, as you guys start to grow and you find out what you're going to do with your lives, make sure you're, you, you pursue something that you're passionate about. Um, you know, I think they say if you do something you love, you'll never do a, work a day in your life. I think that's crap. but. Uh, do something you're passionate about because it, it makes it a lot more enjoyable and then you got to work hard I mean, there's no no way around that if you want to do anything you got to work your ass off um, Be an entrepreneur you got to commit you're either all in or you're in the way and stay in school education for me um, I recommend it, but you know I, I for me I what I wanted to do when I was going to school never ended up being what I'm doing. I wanted to be a architect back when I was in high school. And when I got to school, it didn't fit in with my baseball schedule, so I scrapped it. I took an intro to business class, and that kind of resonated with me, so I pursued business. And 
you know, I don't remember everything from business school. I probably maybe remember 15% about it, you know. But what it does, you know, it'll spark something inside of you. And for me, that was my experience is owning a business, marketing, branding, all those little things that I took in business classes resonated with me. And if I didn't go to school, I probably would have never came across that. So, you know, it'll spark something inside you. I, I recommend it. And then if you have questions, you know, talk to people. It, it doesn't hurt to ask somebody how they got to where they're at. You know, I, I, I still learn stuff every day. I talk to people, friends, artists, you know, I'm always, you know, picking their brains, you know, and talking with people. It, it doesn't hurt. Um, and then take chances, you know, step outside of your, your comfort zone. You, you know, if you, I always look back, you know, if five years ago, if I would have thought I'm doing what I'm doing now, I would have probably laughed at you. Um, I wanted to be, you know, businessman working in the corporate world. You know, I wanted to be an, uh, an analyst at one point, you know, all these little different aspirations, but, you know, here I am selling clothes, so uh, you never know. And setting goals, I, I think it's important. I'll, and I'll finish with just kind of a, an interesting story about setting goals. And, and when I first started the company and, you know, I was trying to network and meet people who, you know, trying to, to really kind of push the brand, you know, I had a list of people who I was like, man, it would be really cool if these guys wore my clothes one day. And one of the, the very first ones, you know, that came to mind was the Tribe Called Red. And, uh, it, you know, it was kind of just something that I, you know, I wish would happen. And then one day when I saw him come out on stage, you know, where, oh, hold on a sec. Push the wrong button. And yeah, so here's the guys from a tribe called Red wearing a bunch of clothes of mine. So, uh, and yeah, I got to say, it was really surreal when that, the first time I saw them, I went to their show and um, it was in Vancouver. I think it was at the P&E and they all came out wearing our stuff. And I was just kind of like, I'd seen photos, some photos around social media, but I'd never saw it in person. And um, when they came out wearing our stuff, I was just like, People were like punching me, look, look, look. And I was like, holy crap. And uh, I ended up becoming friends with these guys. They're really, you know, they're really supportive. And I think the one thing too that, you know, I'm not big on like dropping names and stuff, but uh, I'm super grateful for people like them who have believed in me and helped push, push the company to where we're at now. And so I'm always, you know, I, I try to be super humble and, and thankful for that. And, you know, there's a, a whole long line of really cool people, you know, from Taboo to Dreesus, um, Martin Sensmeyer, Jordan Nolan, a bunch of different, you know, Nako Bear, the, these crazy talented people who believe in me and have supported, you know, what I do. And, you know, at one time that was just, you know, a dream of mine and now it's happening. So set goals, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So I, I would leave that with you guys. And then I guess if there's any questions, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions for you guys. No. Yeah. Uh, 1491 is the year before contact, right? So people talk about 1492 is when Columbus arrived. You know, 1491 has kind of been thrown around, but for us, it was, for me, I took that and I was trying to create a collection based on, you know, a mindset of, of our people before contact, you know, kind of a spin on, you know, decolonizing and all that stuff, but getting back to a place before contact and colonization. So that's where that, that's what that stands for when I use that. Yep. With who? Uh, yeah, I do um, a little bit. I've done some photo shoots with him, and he's a friend of mine. You see his photo up there? <laughs> yeah, J Max, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Which ones? The the, the leggings. 
Uh, the leggings, yes, they'll be back online from the video. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the tank tops, not because it's uh, winter, so we don't really sell it. Um, the leggings are online. The t-shirt, I, I think, is an old, is from last season, so. But the leggings will be there, so. But you can check the website. What we have is up there. We've actually got uh, our biggest release of the year is coming in two weeks on the 24th, and that's kind of right before Christmas. Our, hmm? I'm all out of them, but I can write whatever you need down after. <laughs> Yeah. Um, like, if your, um, prices range, are they all, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, it varies. Uh, T-shirts, you know, we usually keep them between 25 and $30. And hoodies were, you know, depending on, you know, what we do, it's, you know, 60 to $80. You know, we don't try to overcharge. And then shipping is just... It's just a cost that we have to do, and I mean, it, sometimes it's expensive, but shipping from Vancouver out here isn't that bad. Um, how much are the leggings? Uh, I think the ones that are up right there are, are $80, and 70 to $80. dollars we have got a couple more that are coming up in, in two weeks, too, that will come up, so... If you sign up for the mailing list on the website, we send out uh, discount codes all the time, so... That's always, people don't know that, but we throw in discount cones just so people can save money, so. Um, by, well, Section 35 comes from the section in the Constitution that protects and, you know, indigenous and treaty rights in this country. So that was where that came from, and it just made sense to what we're doing. I didn't want to be a brand that just says, you're on Indian land. I don't know. It's already been, it's already been done. In a, you know. <laughs> What's wrong with the Hawks logo? Oh, like an updated version? That would be really cool. Okay, maybe when I'm home one night, I'll just sit down and draw something. Your own what? If you have your own designs, uh, I mean, what are you going to do with it? Isn't it's yours? You get to do something with it, right? Uh, you can email it to me, and I look at it. I mean, it depends. You know, we always look at working with different artists and stuff, and you know, if it fits into what we do, we're always open to that. So, I can give you my email after. Yeah, cool. I haven't actually, and you know, I, at some point it'd be really cool to do that. I have, I mean, other than me, I'm from Muscatchewa, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I ha I've done photo shoots with people out here and stuff, but I haven't really collaborated specifically on anything with someone from here yet. So, but I would, you know, it's it's definitely you know something that I I would love to do. The best advice that somebody ever gave to me? Um, shoot, I've had a, a whole long list of advice given to me, but I think probably, I think the one that I gave is just, you know, step outside of your comfort zone. I think that and just, you know, work, work twice as hard as the person beside you. So, and that was kind of when I, when I got recruited to go play baseball in California, I was told that the person right next to me is going to be just as good, if not better, than me. And the only thing that's going to make step, set me out, set me aside, is is working twice as hard as that person. So yeah, I think you got to work hard and dream and put everything you have into it. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, 
To leave home, yeah. I mean, I was born and raised out here, and it, you know, when I moved, I graduated high school and I moved to California, and to me, it was, it was a big culture shock for me to be surrounded by, you know, Mexicans. You know, I get along. I love Mexicans too, by the way. Uh, but like white people, a lot of white people. Just it was a completely different world from from growing up here on the reserve and being far from my parents and, and my support system. You know, it was really hard. Uh, but I was always kind of my parents really kind of pushed and instilled that you can always come home. Home's always going to be here. And you know, being raised, you know, kind of to be proud of who you are and know where you come from. I think that's it's important that I took that with me, and uh, yeah, I mean there was there was a lot of times where I was homesick, and I almost moved home after two years, and I moved home for the summer, and then I was like, no, I got to go back, and uh, I spent ten years of my life down in in California, so you know, don't be afraid to to, to go out there. You can always come home. I come home all the time when I can. So, <laughs> no more. Well, I just want to say thank you for having me. It's it's kind of this is the first time I've been able to come back to my community and actually you know do some some youth work. I've done youth work in other communities, so it's actually an honor to come here and talk to you guys. So hi hi. Um, uh, I'm real bad at. Okay, so I want to thank Justin for coming out all the way from Vancouver just to come see us. And all of you guys are the only ones that are going to have this Section 35 shirt. Um, so thank you. Justin made them just for us. Uh, so now, if you take a look at your name tag that we gave you this morning, if you have a red dot, you're going to go into the gym for the sports session. If you have a purple dot, you're going to go into the cafeteria where you had lunch for the art session. And if you have a yellow dot, you'll go to the foods room just